I am curious what kind of question you guys have for me today. I think I can lower this down just a little bit. Right. Um, Lorax Imus. Really? Lorax Imus. Are you referring to Don Imus? It's peculiar. But Lorax Imus. Loraximus, Loraximus, like Maximus. Okay, maybe that's it. Uh, my girlfriend listening from the other room wants to know what phys- fictional character do you identify with the most? Mm. Look, like everybody, I see myself in, you know, all the protagonists of, of books and narratives that I like, but I'm not sure that's the question you're actually asking. I forgot to glue in the little light, but it's fine. Um, Yes, I will. Um, oh, I can turn off my ringer so you don't have to hear it. There we go. But I think what you're asking is about like a, a, a fictional character I go back to. And there is there is one, and I've talked about it before. Um, it's Raymond Chandler, Black Mask short stories. And I think in one, he's totally nameless. Uh, yeah, Chandler's hero. Not that I equate myself to Marlowe at all, but I look towards Chandler's depiction of Marlowe and have, since I first encountered Chandler, 18, 19 years old, um, as a guide, right? That's that's what I think we do with characters that resonate to us. We we learn from them, We, we see ourselves in them. And we also take as axiomatic some of their, the ways in which they move through the world. So I'm being general, let me get specific. Marlowe, Chandler wrote extensively about, uh, about writing the detective novel uh, and about what a detective novel is about. And he wrote about this in The Atlantic in the 40s. And it's an essay called The Simple Art of Murder. There's a book of short stories called The Simple Art of Murder. And that that essay is the first piece in it. It's totally worth reading. I think you can actually download the entire thing uh, online. I I think that's a pretty easy thing to do. And there is a way in which he talks about his hero that I really love and have always um, found solace in. And um, it is in, uh, he is saying, he's talking about the fact that even within something like American pulp fiction, there can be, you can build transcendent art. Chandler believed that. And he actually chose the genre of American detective fiction because it was one, a singularly American genre of writing, and two, the critical theorists had not discovered it, and he hated critical theory. He disliked the whole idea of breaking apart the narratives and looking at their cultural significance in the education system. He found it, um, he, he, he had issues with it. And yet he writes in a really amazing way about his hero in this. And so he says in this book, and I'm going to paraphrase, in everything that can be called high art, there is a spirit of transcendence. It may be the raucous laughter of the strong man, uh, uh, but down these mean streets, a man must go who is not himself mean and who is neither tarnished nor afraid. I find that a really amazing thing to hold on to. Down these mean streets, that's where Scorsese actually got the title for his film from what I understand. But down these mean streets, a man must go, a person must go who is not themselves mean and who is neither tarnished nor afraid. That is a fantastic mix of things going on. Um, He must be the best man in his world and a good enough man for any world. This is another Chandler quote. Uh, About his sex life, I care little. He said, I am quite sure he would not spoil a virgin, but he might seduce a duchess. Uh, He talks the way a man of his age talks, that is, with a rude wit, a lively sense, a disgust for sham and a lively sense of the absurd. His range of awareness startles you. Right, that's the one that always gets me when I reread Chandler, uh, which I do frequently. His range of awareness startles you, but it belongs to him by right because it belongs to the world he lives in. (sighs) What else? What else? There's a couple of other pieces, but at, at the end he says, if the world were full of people like him, it would be a very safe place to live without being too boring to be worth living in. Now, the idea 
of being that kind of person, of fitting that sort of, filling that sort of role that we all could do. There's no exclusive, there's nothing exclusive about that, right? Everyone can be that kind of person, be the kind of person that's safe to be around, but not boring to be around, right? Like that's, that's awesome. Um, so Marlo Chandler, thank you for that great question. Um, Jake Treister says, have you put into any thought into what kind of case box you want to make for your matrix lightning gun? Yeah, you noticed it behind me there. There she is. Oh, God, this thing is so beautiful. Oh, man. Yes, I have. So this is one of the lightning guns from the Matrix sequels. Uh, I think we figured out which one it is because in the Matrix, the screen was on the left side and the handle was on the right. Uh, but in the sequels, it's reversed for one of the guns. Uh, yeah, that question, what this goes in. I do have some ideas about what it goes in. I do have some thoughts. And it specifically has to do with uh, it specifically has to do with how the Nebuchadnezzar crew would store their important munitions. Um, clearly, space is at a premium. The space is very uh, chaotic inside, per you know Jeff Darrow's incredible, incomparable production design. Uh, I mean, I know Owen Patterson's production designer. Uh, Jeff Darrow and his drawings, all this wonderful previs. I just love Jeff Darrow. Anyway, um, I thought about it and I do have an idea. I am not going to let you know right now because I'm going to build it. It's going to be a one day build as soon as I really have it in my head. But it's kind of a neat, different uh, approach to the idea of storage. So, yes, thank you for asking. Thanks for checking in. What TV shows did you watch when you were a kid? Uh, so I grew up on the East Coast uh, in uh, Westchester County and New York City. Uh, in the 70s and the most most of the 70s that's my childhood uh, by the 80s I was a teenager um, and uh, yeah uh, Star Trek original series Spider-Man animated Spider-Man Spider-Man they went greetings web slingers the one hosted vocally by Stan Lee uh, you know um, Wild Wild West with uh, Robert Culp Is that, was Wild Wild West. Yeah, Wild Wild West was great. Such a weird show. Mission Impossible. I watched hours and hours and hours of Mission Impossible and didn't understand any of it. Um, but yeah, that was like a that was on constantly. Um, in fact, one of the very first props I ever built uh, was a replica of it was me wanting to play within the Mission Impossible uh, universe. So my dad had this old briefcase that he threw out and I took it and I put a piece of cardboard in it and I put a light and a switch and the switch said detonate and I would hit the switch. <laughs> yeah, Mission Impossible was totally fertile. Um, I recently watched this Saturday morning cartoon show, which I watched when I was a kid and I found it on YouTube and it's called Marlo and the Magic Movie Machine. And... It was funny to watch it for a couple of reasons. One, in the movie, Marlo is like this guy who's like, I don't know, I think he's like a janitor at this giant corporation, but he works in the sub, 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 sub basement, right? But at night, he pulls aside this like shelf and there's a door and he goes through these various doors into a secret room in which this computer lives and he and the computer basically... Um, enjoy watching uh, royalty free footage and then showing it to us, the television audience. This is a great vehicle for like, what do we do with all this free footage? Uh, let's build a structure in which a guy talks to a computer and they're like, mm, hey, we found some footage of a lady in an umbrella and a tiger getting into a, a, a car. So let's do a whole thing about tigers. It was literally like that loose of a narrative uh, thing holding it all together. Um, so clearly, so what, hold on just a second. Someone's at the door. That's my mom. My mom is here uh, to continue sorting Legos because, well, you know how much I like sorting and you know how much I like arranging and you could surmise that there is a sous-son of OCD uh, within my character that enjoys these things. And well, the source is here uh, and she's been helping me uh, sort my Lego collection into something tameable uh, for the past week. It's been delightful. Um, I don't mind the solitude in the shop, but it is also really nice to have someone else around here and there. Um, 
Oh, Marlowe and the Magic Movie Machine, right. So one of the things I did when I was building with Legos when I was a kid was I constantly put uh, secret doors. I loved making like sliding panels with secret doors and, uh, you know, trap doors, you know, ah, all the way down, that kind of thing. Clearly, I got it from Marlowe and the Magic Movie Machine. The other thing that I thought was hilarious about the show was it was so low budget that in the very first broadcast, the very first one I watched, which is just some random one from the middle of the couple of years it was on, um, the actor, Marlo, flubs a line and they left it in. Like they were literally like, yeah, we don't have time to edit it. Broadcast that. Like that I found hilarious. Um, let's see. Cody says, we've talked about playing Beat Saber. Has that branched into trying any other games? Yeah, I'm, I've been trying them all. I've been playing Ninja, something or other. Uh, I just got, I just got, uh, I just got some um, pistol attachments for playing Pistol Whip. These are 3D printed from China, uh, and I'm going to be. There will be a one day build where I make a kind of cool version of this for playing Pistol Whip. Pistol whip is my thing right now. And last night I finally beat, I finally completed the full throttle level on hard without any modifications. That was not easy. It took me like 30 tries. Every other level I've beaten on hard pretty, pretty easily, but that one was kicking my butt. That being said, I'm like, I'm no special thing as a gamer. I still can't get past expert on uh, Beat Saber. Expert plus is like it's like all of a sudden everyone's speaking French and I literally don't understand this game. I have no idea how you play Expert Plus. Yeah, that's totally. Um, just Shy of the Ictus asks, that is literally his name, Just Shy of the Ictus says, uh, as a maker, how do you deal with the inevitability that someone will dislike your work? This is an interesting question because on one level, my first response is I don't care. I make these things for me, but at the same time, um, making stuff, when making stuff that's important to us, uh, it makes us vulnerable. So I have had the experience of making something and giving it to someone who didn't want it and let me know that. And that stung. That, that, stung like real stinging that was not that was non-trivial uh yeah and i didn't know until that moment how vulnerable we make ourselves when we make something and then we give someone the gift of our brain and our heart and our time um all three of those things are are, are valuable assets right and so when we when we take the time to think about somebody or something and we make something in that frame and then we gift it to them uh, so it, I just did a, a build of a thing in my house. Um, I, I built a new piece of furniture for the house. It's about two or three weeks ago. And I'm not the only person who lives in my house. My wife and I both live there. And so as I was making it, I didn't tell her that I was making this thing. And that meant that I'm open to the idea. And I reminded myself, stay open to the idea that this might not work for her. Like it's got to, you know, you make something for the house. You, you want it to work for everybody. Um, certainly I think I'm solving a problem, but we might have a different idea about what that problem is and how to solve it. Uh, so let's see. How, what do you do when someone doesn't like you? Someone random thinking your work is crap. Who cares? They can, they can go to hell. Like there's really like, it, it doesn't have any bearing on, on you. Um, and I, I, you know, I know that we have a lot of, like, we have a lot of forums like DeviantArt and other places like that where people put up their stuff. You know, on the RPF, on the replica prop forum, one of the things that I love most about that forum, and I see it also on DeviantArt, is um, all praise is quite relative. And by that, I mean, you might have someone that says, hey, here is a Star Wars costume I built. I had $75 and four days, and it's mostly duct tape and some tarps I found. Um, and they'll post pictures of it. And people will be like, dude, that's awesome. What a cool thing. And they're not like going, hey, it's not exactly canon. Oh, and you got this thing wrong. There's like, there's 
for a place that can be surpassingly persnickety about perfection, when people post their builds, people always take it in context, right? So if someone posted something like that and said, how close to exactly accurate is it? People would say, well, you got this, 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 right? But they do it with good humor. And so I, I appreciate forums online where that that is the kind of ethos of responding to the quality of something. Um, but like when you post stuff and someone says, that's shit, like that's going to sting. And I mean, we all know that reading the comments is like cutting. Um, but if you're a member of a forum, of course, you're going to read the comments to the stuff that you're talking about. Um, I guess it's a long way of saying, I, I, you know, if I was posting to a forum in which people got... Uh, got, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, salty about uh, how bad your build was, I probably wouldn't be posting to that forum anymore. So, uh, you know, I would look for encouragement where I could find it. Uh, that's that's another thing. I, the thing to realize is you make these things for yourself. Does it satisfy you? Does it sell to you? Does it supply the experience that you wanted, both in its construction and its execution? Um, are you happy having it? Does it, is there something to the experience you want to add, right? Th these are the questions. What does somebody else think of it? I mean, I also recognize I have the privilege of being fairly far removed. I've been making for such a long time and making in the public eye for such a long time. I get a lot of positive feedback. Um, so it's been a while since, you know, I have felt vulnerable in that space, the, the space now that I feel that vulnerability is in, in gifting stuff to other folks. Um, yeah, I, we all got to find our own way to that one. That's, 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 that's a really good question to ask. And it's really good to when something makes you feel like, oh, like strange about a response to sit and examine it. it doesn't mean you have to necessarily workshop it with the person who gave you the response, but it is, a, you know, it's an important part of the practice to kind of let that sit and see see how it landed with you. Um, Delta V, oh, orbital mechanics guy, eh? Uh, Delta V asks, what build or part of a build in your shop had the worst ratio between how difficult you thought it would be to make versus how difficult it actually was to build? Which had the best ratio? <laughs> so the clip of me that went viral recently of me, like my soul leaving my body when I was over at my bandsaw there, and I realized I'd cut two of these four parts completely wrong. Um, I, ju <laughs> I just did a build. I built a, a cabinet for sorting Legos, uh, and I, I screwed up everything about it in the 45 minutes it took me to build this very quick and dirty cabinet. Um, and... I, just like five of those, that mistake that went viral, I made like five of those mistakes in a row. So uh, it's not like, it's not like there's any one that sticks out of like, man, that really kicked my butt. Uh, the, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't have a really super specific answer to that one. Um, okay. Yonder Bosk asks, you've just used oil paints when weathering the detonator. What are the pros and cons of different paints methods for weathering? Um, I like the oil paints specifically for scale. Um, you can apply them incredibly thinly where it's almost like you're not sure you can see them. So it doesn't look like the paint. Um, when you put oil paint on and then you pull it back off, the, despite your best efforts to pull it off, you're still going to have some that you that's kind of uh, in the in the interstices here. I'll show you a, an example. Um, this is this is uh, the hood of the Ecto One, and I mean, it's hard to see in camera, but this thing is covered with black oil paint, and then most of it's been removed. But it sits in small spots that really lend scale to this thing. So I like oil for this. And while I might think about using acrylic, um, I find oil more versatile for me in getting it, getting the paint really into the, the little nooks and crannies. That being said, um, if I have acrylic and I want to get it into those nooks and crannies, I'll often start by a spritz of rubbing alcohol, which tends to act as the thinner. And as the paint hits it, it tends to pull the paint into the corners and then you dab and remove. So you can also get that kind of scale out of acrylic. 
I just tend to. I tend to prefer the. I find for props that I'm going to hold in my hand, the oil paint feels a little bit more. Um, it sells to me a little better. Plus, I freaking love the smell. Um, it's really great. I, acrylic, there's like no smell at all. Um, so for other things like wood, porous materials, I might try different seal. I mean, it's all experimental. I think you're asking me a question as if I have a policy on it, which is a totally reasonable thing to assume and to ask. The answer is I don't. Um, I kind of figure each piece out on its own merits based on what's in front of me. Um, I mean, you just saw me weathering this. I wasn't sure how that was going to go. I didn't know whether what, it was, what colors it was going to change into. And lo, we got somewhere, but it wasn't necessarily where I thought I was going to get to, which is cool. Like, that's why I do it. Hmm. I try and have a little bit of everything around here. Uh, when I read about a material that's interesting, I, I look it up and sometimes I'll order a little bit of it just to see what it's like. Um, I've got all sorts of paints here I haven't even tried yet, you know. Um, yeah, it's across the board. It's case by case basis, let's say it that way. Um, BJ asks, do you turn off your hearing aids when you use some of the louder machines in your shop? Um, yes, but I also, I also love these. Who is this? This is MSA. Um, when we did our sniper episode, can you dodge a sniper bullet? Uh, Dave Lewinog, uh, one of the President's 100 marksmen, just an unbelievable marksman, he was clustering bullets inside a, I'd say about an eight inch circle from a kilometer away. Um, and that was amazing. That was an amazing few days to spend with him and his spotter. And those guys were great. And I, I didn't realize how, uh, 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 symbiotic and important the relationship is between the sniper and the spotter. It's just a fascinating thing. And he had worked for the CIA. I mean, not that he told me anything about working for the CIA, but like the guy's seen some stuff, right? The, he was fascinating. Uh, anyway, on the, on, on, on shoots like that, when I would see experts using certain pieces of safety equipment, I'd be like, what is that? And then I'd write it down. Of course I wrote down his spotting scope and discovered that his spotting scope was like Four thousand dollars. I did not buy that spotting scope, um, but he was using these MSA uh, uh, hearing protectors, and these are uh, these are like gunshot protectors. So you turn them on, and they actually act almost like hearing aids themselves. They amplify the world around you until you clap or make a loud noise, and then they cut that noise out because speed of light is the speed of electricity is so much faster than the speed of sound um this is a pair that i had from mythbusters that allows me to actually wear a hat on top as well while i'm wearing the uh the 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 ear protectors and i have another pair that have just the over pair um so yeah uh i use these a fair bit in the shop especially when i'm like using uh the table saw to cut aluminum or uh cutting out thin plastic on the bandsaw, like a vacuum form, that sound will tear your soul to pieces. Um, all right, let's see here. I'm really making it through almost in order. Um, is there a sequel coming up next year that you are really excited about? Jurassic Park 3, Jurassic World 3, Avatar 2, Suicide Squad 2? You know, I am, I know that it has been a long time coming to see Avatar, but in my experience, Cameron gets it right almost every time. I recently rewatched Avatar and it's still beautiful. It's terrific. I'm a huge fan. I love Titanic. Uh, it's the only film of his that I feel lukewarm towards is True Lies. And it still has a ton of stuff that I love in it. I just didn't connect with the characters as much as I always do in his films. Uh, it's just one, one out of the whole canon of his movies. So I, I'm kind of wondering, right? Like, what's he going to do with Avatar that's going to surprise me? And the answer is probably everything. You know, my friends are all working on it down in, down in uh, at Weta Workshop and, the scale of that production is gargantuan. It's just shocking. And 
uh, you know, it's not an easy shoot. And it's like I said, it's been a long time coming, but I, I, because Cameron's gotten it right so much of the time, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about that one. Um, what else am I? Ghostbusters, man. Ghostbusters Afterlife. I can barely contain my excitement over Ghostbusters Afterlife. Yeah. There's so much more to say about that, but right now, all I can tell you is I'm so excited about Ghostbusters Afterlife. Uh, yeah. that's And I'm sad that it's not coming out this summer. I'm really sad. I, I know they pushed the date back. Oh, that's, that's really, really... That's too bad, but obviously, for obvious reasons. Um, that's the one I think I'm most excited about. Mm. All right. Um, bum, bum, bum. What are your favorite ways to meditate and center yourself when you're unable to organize or build in your cave? I read, I draw when I'm unable to build or organize here in the cave? That's a great question. Because um, when I travel, I, I'm not in the cave. Uh, when I travel for long periods of time, I, I miss using my hands. So I end up, I draw a lot more uh, when I'm on the road. Drawing satisfies a lot of that stuff. Uh, and drawing, by drawing, I mean like doing things in my sketchbook, right? So some of, about two thirds of what happens in my sketchbook is drawings and the other third is just lists of things that I'm thinking about or interested in. Or uh, honestly, sometimes I'll just be like, hmm, how many space suits do I have? Let me make a list. And making a list starts to just feel like I'm getting something done. Um, yeah, drawing is very much a, a, a really key activity. And after like, I've been drawing since I was, you know, five years old. I've been drawing as long as anybody. Uh, and I've been trying to draw like seriously for work for decades, but I've never really liked my line. I've never really liked, I, I, my drawings all felt just like, eh, it is not quite right. And like a friend of mine who's a, a director for Pixar is like, yeah, it's always that way, always that way. My line never does what I want it to do. So, you know, I, I appreciate that, that it's a, it, it might be a universal experience. In the last couple of years specifically, my drawing has gotten, I'm not just going to say it's gotten better, but the line does more of what I want it to do. And that feels really great. It feels like I have a facility now rather than just like the kind of brute force, I'll get to the result eventually kind of way in which I did it before. Uh, and that engenders more drawing. That makes me want to draw more. Uh, and it makes me really happy to look at things that I've drawn. And like, you know, this is a one day build I'm right in the middle of. This is a new base for this little uh, emery blade chop saw. And like, there's so many drawings of all the different parts and pieces of this. And that's really exciting to me at the end of a build to go back and see the kind of progression of to-do lists and little uh, call outs and the ways in which I did things differently than I thought I would. I love, I mean, yeah, the bricolage, as Tom Sachs puts it, all of the ancillary pieces around creation are fascinating to me. So like on my, on my, on my tables, on my drill press, um, on, on any drill press, you should have some sacrifice, some sacrificial pieces of wood, right? So when you drill through something, there's a piece underneath it. Uh, so you're not just drilling into your drill press table. So this is one of my sacrificial pieces of wood. It actually happens to be the center from an old Mythbusters experiment, I think. Uh, and it's even got some measurements on the back that I don't even remember what they're from. But this is like, this is like what Tom, I think, would call a holy scrap, right? Like, I love this kind of thing. I can't remember what the original question was. Uh, Tristan P. says... You've always said drawers are the enemy of sanity. I've said that drawers are where things go to die. Uh, and the easiest way to lose things, agreed. So how do you organize them to be the most orderly? Foam core dividers and trays? Why, yes. Why, yes, my friend. For instance, let's get this there. Um, for instance, here, where I keep my Sterrett, combination squares and my nice measuring equipment this is the drawer in which i store that stuff and you see oh yeah here's some of my angle finding protractors here's the really good one 
this is my uh, my my machinist level, my center finder. Uh, yeah. So the trick with drawers for me is to figure out what goes in them and let those things live there where they should. And all the drawers in this workbench are the same way. Um, that takes its own level of commitment, right? Like I, 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 uh, like I need to decide what goes in there. When I made this, everyone had tested got a combination square, right? Cause I had like five or six of them from over the years and some are crap and some are great. And you know, when you find a nice, yeah, that's the Starrett. Uh, when you find the Starrett one, that's the one you want. You don't need any of the others. You can get rid of them. And that's been really nice. So uh, Jen Schachter has been the recipient of a bunch of the old tools. Um, and it means that you don't like, and if every maker ends up with like six or seven of this or two, two or three of that. And I, I'm always a fan of having more than one of something. So if it breaks, you have a backup, but you don't need five of something. Give it away, give it away, give it away, give it away now. Uh, what is your favorite scale to work at while model making? And why is it your favorite? Mm, nope, I can't say that I have a favorite scale. Uh, I mean, when I worked on Topoka City for episode two, um, that big hero building in front of which Django and uh, 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 Obi-Wan have their battle, uh, that was like one one thousandth scale, right? I think it was gigantic, ginormous. That was really fun. Um, when I worked on uh, 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 AI, I worked in sixth scale for some of these shots. There's this long panning shot through a decrepit office building full of office furniture. And that was a practical MoCo shot. Uh, and uh, a bunch of folks and I at ILM built Tons and tons and tons. And I think I showed one of the bottles last week. Um, tons of one six scale um, stuff. And we bought a lot of dollhouse furniture, but then we also tore a lot of it to pieces and molded and made new versions of stuff. Um, you know what nobody makes in the dollhouse world? Almost nobody in the world makes a cage fan, right? Like a, 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 like a steel wire cage with a fan blade inside it spinning. Those were impossible to find, and the art director wanted one, so we made one. I think I, I think I have it. Uh, I'll have to go look for it. Um, that I did with laser cut acrylic. All right, let's see here. Um, if you had an unlimited budget for one improvement to your shop, what would you choose to add? Right at this second, it would be an extra fifteen hundred square feet. I, I, I mean, this is a shop bill for one person. I, it might look large in some of the shots, but you put two people in here working and this place gets claustrophobic in a hurry. Uh, and I joke that if you gave me an extra 1500 square feet, I'd still have my tools this close. I might move them a little farther apart. The sanding area has always been a shit fight, but, uh, uh, but I have always, always, always wanted the ability to bring my car, my Land Cruiser, into my shop and work on it indoors. And I have never, until last year, had the ability or opportunity to work on a car indoors. Every bit of car repair I have ever done has been on the streets of San Francisco. So I've done the thing where you pull up on the curb so that your car is a little more distance and I run a creeper underneath that. That was how I replaced the U joints on the drive shaft of my Volvo 245 DL that I owned in the early nineties. Uh, you know, and working on the street means every time you got to go take a pee, you got to take all your tools with you because the rule in a city is if it's on the street, it's free unless there's someone there to say, don't take that. I know that's a weird rule, but it seems to be the rule. Uh, so, uh, when I was making Savage Builds, at one we had that wonderful warehouse down in the Bayview uh, near Flora Grub where we were filming. And one a couple of weekends, I brought my Land Cruiser in. In fact, I had a leak around my roof. So I went into the shop and spent a whole weekend pulling the roof off, resealing it, adding some new headliner. I added a skylight just because I wanted something to do. 
uh, and working on my car indoors with tools around and like welders and stuff at my disposal, <gasps> it was intoxicating. Oh man, I want some more of that action. So yeah, unlimited budget. I'd knock out that wall and have another 1500 square feet. I mean, I could actually pull my Land Cruiser into this shop, but I'd have to do a lot of rejiggering and it would not be easy. Um, yeah, that's, thank you for that question. That was neat. Um, John Wise asks, do you still have a junk drawer? Do I ever? I have tons of junk drawers. I have junk drawers all over the place. This is, a. this is my, uh, here, wait. Let's, um, pull this over here. There we go. This is my shop speaker. Uh, it is powered by a beautiful Meyer sound uh, 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 speaker system in there, and it's hooked up to uh, a voice assistant, which I don't have it hooked up to right now because I'm using all my internet to uh, to get out to the world through the computer. Um, but this right here is a junk drawer, right? Like this stuff on top, stuff I'm still not sure what to do with. I'm waiting for a second part for this one. I don't know where to store the mist maker. This has to go in one of these drawers I haven't pulled out yet. So there, there's one junk drawer. But you're also asking, I think, about log jam. Um, and log jam, Log jam is uh, Tom Sachs's name for stuff in your shop. That was my master replica thermal detonator dropping off the table because I wasn't paying attention. Hang on just a sec. Let me go get it. There we go. We'll pull that out and examine that later. Uh, so log jam is Tom Sachs's uh, term for things that are too valuable to throw away, but not worth the time to sort. Here's my log jam um, for right now. Yeah. And uh, I borrowed this technique from Merrick Cheney, uh, amazing machinist who on the team that made, uh, good God, so many things. Kane robot from RoboCop 2, Jack Skellington's armature, a master machinist. And he uses baking pans in a wooden rack he built to store baking pans for active, uh, for active projects. So for instance, um, for like replacing the vents on my R2D2 with all aluminum vents, they live here to like get around to it. Um, my in progress eye of Agamotto is over there. And so is a couple of other projects. And in the bottom two shelves is all is all the log jam. It's all the things that I don't necessarily have a home for uh, and lots of nuts and bolts and little things to be sorted eventually. So yeah, we all have junk drawers, man. Nobody escapes. There's just not enough time in the day, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, every now and then I'll take the junk drawer spread it out on the table. It is a particular mood I've got to be in to do such a thing. Um, the Old Stone asks, do you tend to draw analog paper and pencil or like an iPad with the pencil? I have, uh, I have an iPad. I have an Apple pencil. I love the feel. I love the responsiveness of it. And I cannot for the life of me draw regularly using it. I've tried. And I try about every six months because... I feel like it should be useful. I feel like it's a way in which it, I feel like there is a lot of ways in which such a thing could be useful to me. And yet I have, I, I don't know. I, I, it just hasn't resonated yet. And again, the, the resistance and the response and the, when you zoom in on the sketch and see the pencil texture, I mean, Apple pencil is a, it's just, it's perfect. I literally wouldn't change a thing. I think it's ma a masterpiece. And yet I can't draw using it. Like the, I keep trying, I keep trying, I keep trying. Got all these drawings like from every six months on my iPad. Um, so no, it's all analog for me. It's all pencil and it's this. Um, I know people send me mechanical pencils and other folks think that I should get a better one. But the Papermate Sharpwriter 2 is just, it's what I'm paced for. It's my favorite one. Um, and I mean, maybe it's that like I lose pencils all the time. So if I had one nice mechanical pencil that, that I... 
it wouldn't supply for me because I would lose it. So I buy the paper mates by the case. And there's always like, I can see six over there and three or four over there and two over there. And so there's always one nearby. That's that, that, that makes me quite happy. Last question. Are we all, it's been 90 minutes. It feels like it's been 45 to me. Uh, last question. Aquino asks, you were going to be giving the commencement address at my university, Rowan University. Due to the coronavirus, that won't be possible this year. Do you have plans to give an address at our school next year? Yes. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I, I will tell you I recorded a little something for you all this very morning, and uh, I believe we are uploading it to the school right now. Now, really sorry, I can't be there in person at Rowan for your graduation. Uh, however, um, I worked I, I, I worked hard on this thing that I, I, I uh, recorded this morning. Um, my wife gave me some fantastic counsel uh, for it, and I'm looking forward to you seeing it. Um, and... Yes, we are still already talking about me coming next year when, you know, people can actually be together if that is the way the world works next year. Again, it's anybody's guess. Uh, but I am super honored. I was and am super honored to be asked to give a commencement address uh, and um, delighted to be able to supply something in this time. And yeah. Um, seriously, I literally recorded it and finished, uh, started uploading it about half an hour before I started this broadcast. Um, thank you guys so much. These broadcasts go faster and faster and faster every single week. Uh, I really appreciate you joining me for this in my cave. It is really nice to, 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 to have you and to know that we are, that we are here together. Um, please stay safe. Uh, keep up to date on the news in your area about the best ways in which to stay safe. Remember, we wear the masks to protect others, not ourselves, uh, and uh, stay away from each other. Stay in contact with each other. Uh, stay safe, and I will see you guys next week. And, well, we'll keep on releasing one-day builds as fast as I can make them. Thank you guys so much for joining me. See you next week. Awesome. All right. Let's uh, end this broadcast. Uh, end stream. There we go.